Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious efforts that you feel desired, taken care of, and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm sharing about how to get your husband to want a baby. My guest, Liz, has been a licensed marriage and family counselor for 35 years. But she was on her way to a second divorce after her marriage counselor told her that her husband had a narcissistic personality disorder. And that explained why he was always grumpy and on her case and downright scary at times. The people around her also thought she should leave him. But she discovered a way to make her relationship fun, inspiring, intimate, and filled with laughter again. She's going to tell us exactly how to do that so that you can do it too. Then I'll be giving out the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award, which exposes a very common recommendation about communication that does way more harm than good. All of that is coming up, but first, let's talk about how to get your husband to want a baby. I'm going to discuss four unconventional ways to grow your family. It's so normal for you to want a baby, and then another, and maybe even another. Maybe your heart yearns for enough babies to form your own basketball team, or maybe you want to have a baseball team of your own. But what if your husband isn't on board? What if he thinks you already have enough kids? What if he doesn't even want one child? One husband told his wife that they needed to work on their marriage before they'd be ready to conceive. So to his wife, that sounded the same as, we're never having a baby, which made her wonder about the benefit of being married at all, since she had always wanted a family. But just because he's shaking his head now doesn't mean he won't get behind the idea of growing your family. There are a few simple things you can do to make him much more open to the idea. Here's how you can inspire your man to say yes to a bundle of joy. Number one. Get happy. If you are often exhausted, overwhelmed, or depressed, or otherwise unhappy, your husband may see the prospect of a new tiny family member as too burdensome because he's already having a hard time keeping you happy. To paraphrase George Michaels, if his best isn't good enough, then how can it be good enough for two? He gets a lot of his own sense of success from knowing that you're thriving and delighted. In my experience, all husbands do. If he sees you laughing and smiling, he feels proud. When you're stressed and complaining, he feels stressed and tired too. And he may think, because you may have said it, that you have too much to do already. If the problem seems to be that you're overburdened, a baby is not going to make sense to him. That's more burden not less. He wants you to be happy again. When that goes missing, he feels overwhelmed. But of course, the only person who can make you happy is you. If you're laughing at the slapstick comedy that is your home life, instead of yelling or nagging, he's going to have an easier time understanding the draw of extending the family. If you're singing and smiling most of the time, He's going to feel relieved and see more possibility for a bright future, including a near future with a bundle of joy. If it's a baby you want, figure out how to delight yourself every day. Number two, appreciate him. Alicia got the heartbreaking news that she and her husband could not conceive. Undeterred, she quickly hatched a new plan. She told her husband, I think we should adopt. But he didn't seem to think it was such a good idea. She was frustrated and she tried to persuade him of all the positives. They'd be able to skip pregnancy and delivery and just bring home their child, giving an unwanted baby a good home. Her husband changed the subject. When she told me about her challenge getting the baby she wanted, she was feeling hopeless. He just Seems to shut down whenever I say the word baby, she told me. From what Alicia shared, I had a feeling her husband was not feeling very appreciated. In single-mindedly seeking maternity, she had stopped appreciating him and all that they had together. She was constantly talking about the baby, the baby, the baby that he couldn't give her. When Alicia realized that, she decided to express her gratitude for her husband. She told him, 
As much as I want a baby, if I never get one, I'm just so grateful to have you as my husband. Having a baby would be icing on the cake of getting to spend all my days with you. That's what she said. It was a moving moment for both of them. And the next day, her husband brought home adoption paperwork. True story. Number three, express your desires in a way that inspires. Alicia's husband might have also been more receptive to her being so family-minded if she had said what she wanted in an inspiring way. At first, she was telling her husband what to think. And that never works in my experience. My husband does not like when I argue with his thinking or try to persuade him with logic. So even though it's as tempting as devouring a freshly baked cookie to indulge in the great baby debate, consider sticking to your desires instead of arguing with his thinking. He might be right that it isn't the best time to conceive while you're still nursing or he's changing jobs, for example. But if that doesn't change your desire, then you can simply honor yourself without contradicting him by saying, I hear you and I would love another baby. After acknowledging how much she valued her husband, all Alicia needed to say was, I would love to adopt a baby. It wouldn't have been a demand, even though she wanted that child with all her heart. Her husband couldn't wait to grant her heart's desire once she said it that way. That's how inspired he was. Number four, affirm his fathering. What if your husband is too harsh with the kids or he loses his temper with them or he lets them eat cereal out of the box in their pajamas when you're gone? That's something I hear a lot of moms say happens, that their husbands don't parent the same way as them at all. It's easy to start thinking that you're the better, the more conscientious parent. You might think he needs some help knowing how to be a good dad. It's only logical to want to give him some helpful suggestions. And what I've discovered the hard way is that helpful in wife language equals critical in husband language. Oh, I'm going to say that again because it just ugh, it just blew open the whole thing for me. What I discovered the hard way is that helpful in wife language equals critical in husband language. No joke. My husband got defensive when I tried to help him improve. And he started to avoid me so he wouldn't have to hear about all the ways that I knew better than him. I thought I was subtle. He thought I was insufferable. And looking back, now I can see why. Maybe you've done the same thing with your husband in the area of his fathering. You didn't mean to be critical, but that's how he heard it when you told him to be careful when he was throwing the kids in the air. The less he feels successful as a dad, the less appealing it is for him to want to take on another kid. If you have kids, finding the things you admire about your husband's parenting and acknowledging them does wonders for turning that around. If you don't have kids yet, admiring how he interacts with tiny relatives or friends' kids or letting him know how much you appreciate how patient and tender he is with you will go a long way toward opening up a possibility that wasn't there before. If he knows that you think he's an amazing dad or he will be, he's going to feel more inclined to take on a child or another child, especially if he knows that saying yes to a baby will make his wife ridiculously happy. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. My guest Liz has been a licensed marriage and family counselor for 35 years, but she was on her way to a second divorce after another marriage counselor told her that her husband had a narcissistic personality disorder. That explained why he was always grumpy and on her case and downright scary at times. The people around her thought she should leave him. 
but she made a discovery that changed everything and has made her relationship fun, inspiring, intimate, and filled with laughter again. Liz, welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast. Thanks for coming on the show today. Oh, Laura, I'm so grateful. I'm honored for this opportunity. Thank you. Well, great to hear. Start by, if you would, sharing with us what things were like in the bad old days of your marriage. Wow. It covers a lot of years when you think of two marriages. Bad old days were so bad that, I mean, in two instances, even the police had to be called because my husband had become violent and it was um, scary and dangerous and I mean otherwise you know we're I mean we're church going church leader type people known and and appreciated in the community so it was just didn't fit with you know how we really looked on the outside there was if at the very best Laura I would say that we we just tolerated one another which was very lonely and very sad. That was the best. Now, there were times, of course, that were wonderful. And that's why, you know, we just passed a 25th wedding anniversary, which everybody was like, wow, how did you ever do that? Well, now I know and can tell them why. And it's one of the reasons that I'm here. At the worst, it was it was scary. There was a lot of more yelling on my part. And the longer I'm studying the intimacy skills and and learning about myself, the more I understand what was coming from me and how I was counting on my husband. And I did this in my first marriage too, to make me happy and how critical I could be. I didn't think of myself as controlling. In fact, I felt very controlled and Mm -hmm. felt that I couldn't do anything right. And I even couldn't express an opinion without feeling like it was wrong and it was stupid or silly. And so there was this thing going on, which made me lose a lot of personal confidence. But I realized that this was not what I had signed up for, especially for a second marriage and especially did not want a second divorce. And so we struggled along. It was at times Cold War. At times, it was uh, on my part, I have to admit, I mean, I can't believe when I think about now, my husband would retreat to a guest room and lock the door, and I'd be pounding on the door, begging him to love me. Love me, love me, love me. If you love me, you'd make love to me. I mean, ah, I know now. Wow. Um, And I so see my side now of what I was doing, but it was lonely, it Mm. was miserable. And the embarrassing thing was, Laura, here I was a marriage and family counselor Mm -hmm. and well-regarded in the community and had the blessing of seeing success, seeing people make better choices. The more I worked with men though, I started seeing the power that I learned from you that women really have the best kind of power. And so Mm -hmm. the change started to happen when I started researching. I was writing a book for myself at the time, and I started researching Laura Doyle's works. And that's where really huge eye-opening. And that went on for almost two years. So I I mean, I love, first of all, I thank you so much for sharing the about the part where you were pounding on the door and saying, you know, come out here and love me because it, it's so relatable because I just remember really doing the same kinds of things. It, this uh, fear and desperation would just kind of take over. And it's like, well, no wonder we fought. But at the time, I didn't realize that I was contributing. I, I thought there was just something wrong with him. and And you may have thought, something similar with your husband. Like there's just something wrong with him. I mean, to have incidents where the the police come out, right? I mean, that's some drama. And so it's very easy then to get distracted and look and say, well, it's obviously his, it's his temper. It's his impatience or, so, I mean, what uh, was there a moment we thought, okay, we, we can't go on like this. Yes. To the point of um, speaking to at least one attorney and he did too. Be staying on the fence 
Oh my goodness. And yes, that is very painful in many ways. And as you say, and uh, leaving, begging him to leave. I mean, we hit the breaking point a number of times and there was just something that just said, you know, and once I read Empowered Wife, I realized, well, wait a minute. I really do have a good man. Wait a minute. And I didn't want a second divorce. You know, I think had I had the skills in my first marriage where I had two wonderful children and especially seeing what they went through after a 21-year marriage and then seeing what they went through with the divorce, I didn't, and they were very close to their stepdad. And I don't believe in the word step. I think he's full-fledged grandpa now. So um, I just really, I just, wanted to keep the marriage and I wanted it to become safer and better Mm. and I wanted to grow old with him Mm. and I wanted to share the grandchildren with him Mm. I just did not want a divorce I didn't want to stay miserable I didn't want to be injured but I wanted to stay in a good marriage in a healthy marriage Yeah, again, so relatable, right? We all want that so badly. Like, I want to grow old with this guy, but just how in the world can I stand him or live with him? And I really hear the same thing. So, and uh, especially since you really devoted your life, it sounds like to the study of relationships as a as a counselor, right? As a as a therapist, so you had a lot invested in making this marriage work. But sometimes it can be hard to be open to a new way of looking at things. So, but you were open. So, so how did that happen? How did you discover the skills and what did you start doing differently? Well, it started with, um, I remember right where I was sitting outside on a lounge chair reading, and I had read a few of the others earlier and they made sense to me, but I had a mighty change of heart. I mean, it was just like, blinders fell off my eyes when I was reading and I was underlining and I was saving quotes from your book and then saying, wait a minute. And then I felt this overwhelming sense of, wow, first of all, I've been really disrespectful Mm -hmm. and had no clue because that's just not, I don't see that in my being. And what I did right away, I put down the book And I wrote a text to my husband and apologized for being disrespectful. And it was hard, but it felt really good. It was a relief. And boy, was it a shocker to my husband. (laughs) He He returned. He sent a text back, which was unusual for him, and thanked me. And that was the beginning of the transformation. And I kept reading and it was like you were watching you. I love the way you told on yourself. And it was just, it was just hitting home, hitting home so much of it. And I started incorporating it and seeing pockets of improvement where we would go for longer periods of time. And I felt better. And now I understand it's because I was being respectful and being the dignified person that I guess I kind of see myself and hope that I really am. And it wasn't until the coach training came up, I had an opportunity to take part in the podcast. And again, the, the skills, the philosophy here, I've been doing it this one way all these years, open always to learn and lots of workshops, but this was different. And coming from the position of being a marriage and family counselor, I could see or start to see in the beginning what was different. And then in coach training, that's when I really started practicing it consistently and saw a difference in how my husband was responding to me and drawing closer to me and tiptoeing at first, like, who is this person (laughs) Who is this lady? <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> He's like falling out of his chair. You see his head exploding. Like, what's yes. happening here? So it was a it was a sea change, but it also sounds like it felt like the real you was showing up. Oh. Is that right? I love that. 
Laura, and I love the concept of our best self is our real self. And that's who we strive and I've strived to become. And it's been, you know, a two year journey for me that every day that I get to use the skills in real life, I'm still married to the same man. And some of the same crabbiness still comes home and shows up at my door. And even some of the, and now I recognize the bait. And some of it's a punch in the, like a slap in the face type verbal bait. Mm -hmm. And it is miraculous to see the difference in how I respond and how short lived those, what used to have, could have ended up in violence turned into a short time of normal human, mere mortal woman, me, and mere mortal man, him, that we would move on from. I love, there's so much compassion in that, the way you say it. It's like, well, I'm, I'm a mortal, he's immortal. It's not, it's not going to be perfect, but this is, it sounds like better. There's more peace. And um, like you say, it could have really escalated in the past to something pretty ugly. And it sounds like now you're able, you have, you feel like you have the power to create a more peaceful outcome. You know, he didn't really change. I changed. (laughs) Um, His reactions to me changed dramatically. And I even asked him the other day, I said, you know, what do you think has changed so much? And his answer it's funny to me but it's serious as anything he said you're not so much on the edge anymore ready to go off the cliff (laughs) I know what he means oh (laughs) Laura I was I was a I could be a crazy woman and I mean when I think of it now and even the thing that was the biggest wake up for me when I learned about respect and learned about um gratitude and 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 the oxygen aspect of that when i could clean up my side of the street and recognize when i was being disrespectful my husband who used to tell me he was afraid of me he was afraid of me and he used to say i was the abusive one and i had to recognize you know When I thought I was just standing up for myself and defending myself and saying all these like even counselor type responses, it was escalating and making him more and more upset with me to the point of, you know, lashing out on his part. He, I have to admit, actually stayed calmer longer than I did. I was the one I had to recognize that would go off. And he did not feel safe to draw close to me. And can you imagine, I study this, I help other people do this. Faith is a huge part of my life. And here I am chasing this man, you know, kicking and screaming, we're running away from lovey me. I mean, I'm just this love person. And it it was just such an eye opener and a relief to have a pathway to know how to be my best self. And the more I practice, it's not an instantaneous thing. The more I practice, the more I love myself, the more I can laugh at myself. And as a result, um, there's a lot more humor and safety in our relationships. So the best self thing is an ongoing process. I mean, it's still going. I never, I want to do it uh, as long as I have breath and maybe into the eternities because I think it is just such a such a helpful righteous thing it's a godly way to live for me so i'm not done it's just like i feel like every day there's there's a new thing that comes up i'd love to share an example um just the other day you know just the other day i was tiptoeing around cuz i had woken up early and my husband was staying sleeping and i tiptoed for like 2 hours and then i started worrying about him a little bit and i peeked back in the bedroom the bed's made And I was like, wow, it's been two hours. And his car was still there. And I was like a little irked, like, you know, he had time to sleep late. And here I am. I sort of went back into that bad place that makes me miserable. And he comes in the door and he's all sweaty. 
And I said, you know, and he looked real grumpy and I'm used to be extra reactive to his grumpy and I'm getting better, getting better. I'm thanks to these intimacy skills. I'm learning how to deal with that. But he just said, he said an interesting word to me, which was actually funny, but it was, it would be a true put down. And then he said, I've been out cleaning the pool. Now the pool is not just a luxury to me. It's my physical therapy. It's, it's my major self-care and everything. And I was like, busted. I was so embarrassed. And I just immediately knew what to do and apologized for being so disrespectful and poured on the gratitude. And he just laughed and laughed. And, you know, I mean, it was, if that had happened in the past, Laura, it would have been days of misery and really scary. Wow. Is that like a superpower to be able to turn that situation around so quickly? And and I, I love your humility too, Liz, in being so so quick and your accountability, right? Like, oh, this is me assuming the wrong thing and I want to clean that up right away, which uh it's not always easy to do, right? Sometimes I might I can choke a little bit on those those words, you know, trying to get them out myself. So but um it sounds like they're they're right there at the ready for you. Yes. And and again, that's with, you know, until I got coaching myself, there was such value in that. It actually came at a time, Laura, when we had another incident where there was violence and I was injured. And this time I, I turned to the church. I didn't turn to the police. But the difference was it wasn't that I was some, you know, people would say, oh, you're letting him get away with it and all this and that. You know, I get I get a lot of that, too. But I was able to go into my car, do some self-care, listen to some music, breathe, call a dear friend who has known me forever and also knows my husband and settle myself and also call a leader in the church for some guidance and some support. And I was able to slow down time and nurture myself. I was injured. I had to go to the doctor the next day. I did have an injury. And of course, they're like, well, we need to report it and all this and that. But I was, again, it wasn't being weak. It was out of my empowerment that I said, I need to take a better look at this. And even though I got to see that when I checked my side of the street that I technically hadn't done anything because I was really actually true to the skills that he, his, whatever was going on with him was his stuff. And I may have said a thing or two, even in asking him to stop that could have come been disrespectful. So I was able to, to own that and go back into massive self-care and be able to return to the situation um, with, you know, with loving support and recommit. But the coaching actually helped me stay the course. That was my takeaway, that I was could stay the course and that I wasn't being an idiot putting up with this abusive man, that this was a good man and that there was more going on. And, and indeed, there was more going on. And it built my confidence in my ability to slow time down and stop being reactive and take care of myself and make myself peaceful and safe and eventually joyful enough where that's history again. And it's not that long ago. And it just shows that it's never going to be perfect. And I no longer expect him to him to show up a certain way to make me better, happier, safer, whatever, that uh, the empowerment is real. And it's increasing, Laura, over time. The more I practice, the more I learn it, the more I continue with it, listen to the podcasts, which to me are just, that's such a self-care thing for me. It just does so much for me. But now I know what to do to put myself in a better place to get closer to being that best self. And my daughter has noticed it. My daughter and I have had kind of a, I love her dearly, a rocky relationship. Uh, I won't say her exact age, but she's over 40. And she's the mother of two granddaughters that I have. And then some other children that I claim as grandchildren. And she notices the difference. And I have been passing on the skills to her. And she now is starting to talk the talk and seeing differences too. And even my granddaughters have said, 
you're so much calmer. You're so much happier. Wow. And my son, who knows me better than anybody, could say anything to me. Who And I, I have two grandsons with him. He said, you know, mom, you're just so much easier to talk to. And you don't react anymore. And it's just like, hallelujah. <laughs> I mean, you know, for me and for the people that know me, it is a miracle. Wow. So it's affecting all your relationships. You're showing a as your best, your best Liz in all of your relationships, it sounds like, which uh, I love it. And it's, I know for me, it's such like, it creates more intimacy and connection in all my relationships. And it sounds like you're having the same thing um, with your adult kids or, and, and probably with your grandkids yes. and too. So I want to just bounce back to this. Um, I, I just really appreciate so much that your vulnerability and courage to share about the the violence in your home and that you were injured and that you, your decision was still to stay and work on yourself and look at what's on your side of the street and your own power, even though it has to be a very scary thing that that's, that's your history together. And yet, I guess I just want to kind of highlight that your marriage is 51% good. Yeah, at least 51% good right there, but maybe more than that. But I'm just yes, saying, okay. yeah, right? Like on the day when you say like, you know, can I stay or should I go? Uh, it's at least 51%. And you're not the only person. We know that there, I know there's lots of women and it, it can be one of the most embarrassing things to talk about, like that there's physical violence at my home. And yet we know this goes on other places. And for you to say, wow, you know, I was injured and I'm, you know, I'm calling the church and and I know uh, you've shared with me that in the past, people have said, you know, you have to leave him. You should leave him. You've got to get safe. That's kind of the conventional wisdom. And yet I, I hear this conviction for you. Like, no, this is the man I love. This is my family. I'm going to do what I can. It isn't perfect. So I guess I'm wanting to hear a bit about how, what is your relationship like now? Let me, let me ask that. Well, uh, and thank you. Um... Asking for what I want, knowing what I want first, and then asking in a way that inspires has been magical. I use the example of the, my husband used to, to me, not like to do anything for me and would be very verbal about it and say, I don't want to, no. And he would turn me down and it would really hurt. <laughs> so instead of whining and complaining, I was able to flip that. And I'll use a simple example of, of an egg salad sandwich. It would be a long day for both of us, but he's out and I'm working from home. And I would say, I would love an egg salad sandwich. And I really, truly released expectations. I was prepared to make something else or whatever. And poof, an egg salad sandwich would show up for dinner for both of us. <laughs> I <love> and... <laughs> It's my metaphor. The excellent sandwich is my metaphor that I, two things. One, I'm learning how to ask. You taught me in your book, and I've practiced, that you don't always get what you want. And instead of being, wah, wah, poor me, and feeling sorry for myself, and whining about it, and being ungrateful, I have learned how that, again, that's just, it's respectful, and it's dignified. And I know how to take care of myself now. I can go get my own egg salad sandwich, or I could make one in the kitchen if I really need to. Um, the other thing is seeing the hero in my husband. That was hard when I spent so much time. And I've got to, I need to add something as a disclaimer too. I would get so upset that I would also become physical to him. Okay. And I'm much smaller than him and weaker. And that's hard to admit because, you know, I'm a martial artist and I'm a peacemaker. And and there are times I'd be so frustrated that I, I you know, I'd go out and I, I you know, fortunately, um, I mean, it didn't happen often, but it happened enough to, to make me realize, holy cow, you know, anybody can lose it. And I sure can. And the better I take care of myself, the less likely I am to go there. And even since this last incident and the coaching and the continued work that I've been doing in the program, that was almost one of the best things that ever happened to us because I am better able to see this hero that my husband is and mm -hmm. see and hear and understand his heart message. And I knew the concept in a sense, but Laura, it has been life changing. First of all, it just makes me feel loved because there's so many things I see now that he does that are loving that I can thank him. 
and say, I feel so loved. Just the other day, I texted him thanking him about something that really surprised me because, you know, he has told me before, by the way, I will never clean that pool again. I mean, not too long ago. And there he was, got up and did it, you know, so I'm saying, you know, finding that there is that hero. And, um, and when you recognize the, the heart message, being able to feel, let myself bask in that love and be able to use the self-fulfilling prophecy for myself I am loved and I am lovable. And and to him, you know, what a loving husband you are. He used to tell me he could never please me. And as a result, you know, I'm sure that's how he felt and would act. And then I started understanding through practicing the skills and understanding the heart message, looking for it, allowing him to be my hero, taking that in and bathing myself with, with that. Um, wow, it, it's just been a life changer. And as a result, I'm getting much more um, like he texted me in this recent thing and just said, I love you, Liz. That's different for him. This is just the other day. I love you, Liz. Simple text. But mm -hmm. I felt the love through that text. That's where I'm different, Laura. In receiving, I'm able to receive. And practice that. Oh, really? It shows me up. You know, this unpleasable woman now knows how to receive. And as a result, my husband shows up as my hero. And he'll joke about it like, yeah, 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 whatever. And it's like, no, this is huge. I love you. I'm so grateful for you doing this. And the gratitude is just so natural to just. I just feel I live in a state of gratitude now mm -hmm. and it brings, you know, same man, but it brings out the best in this man who used to be very, very scary, angry, cold, distant to me. And he isn't at all. And I'm, I'm seeing that, you know, me taking the, doing the work, that I am in control of, loving being accountable for what is on my paper. The concept of staying on my, oh, I'm an old school teacher from way back too, and a guidance counselor. And, you know, we would tell the kids, stay on your own paper, you know, stay on your own paper. And so that concept really spoke volumes to me. And as soon as I learned how to recognize what's on my paper and what isn't, read them. I mean, <laughs> read them. It was wonderful. And then I knew what to do with what was on my paper. The other thing that was the greatest gift I got from you and Kathy and Stephanie is the, and I quote it in my mind all the time, my husband's mood is on his paper. Uh -huh. Best wisdom for me because he can be in a grumpy mood. He can be whatever. He can have an expression on his face that before I'd say, what's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? You know, and it would really bug him. And now I can be on my paper. And if he's in a grumpy mood, I have this whole list of inside and outside self-care things I can do and more every day. And so it's, it's the transformation again it's still happening and I have to stay, you know, I want to keep practicing and keep fine tuning. It's remarkable, Laura, and I'm deeply, deeply grateful. So inspiring, Liz. Amazing. What would you, if you could go back in time and talk to yourself back then and share what you know now, what do you think you would say to yourself? I love that question. Um, I'd say, chucks me up too. Um, Liz, you did marry a good man. Liz, you are a wonderful, loving woman. Don't wait. Find this wonderful organization and this wonderful woman, Laura Doyle, and Laura Doyle Connect, and open your heart and your mind to learning a way of being that is so respectful. It's self-respectful as well as respectful to my husband and others learn these skills practice these skills be open to recognizing um being a mere mortal woman 
and what that means and forgive yourself and give yourself grace and give it to others as well. And um, that there is always hope that even in a dark time, like an ugly fight, argument, or worse, that there is always hope that because of these intimacy skills and practicing them, that I can be better, I can be happier, I can be safer, and I can show up in a way that where I become a magnet and miraculous things can happen. So keep the hope and know that you have the power within you as a woman to do these things. Mm, so good so good so and what would you say to a woman who is maybe where you were she's having they're having violence in the home she's pounding on the door saying come out and love me um and she wants to create what you have where she wants to create your egg salad sandwich and your pool getting clean <laughs> and the laughter and the um yeah like the sense of um like i hear a sense of uh, peace that's at your house. Where should she start? What's your best tip for her? Well, I have the obvious answer because I found it myself by picking up one of your books. And I've been many, 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 many others before. But I would say first, take a breath and realize that there is hope and it can be different. And it can be different in a way that is personal to you and your desires. And it starts with taking care of yourself and realizing that you have the power to make yourself really happy and contented. And with that as a first step with self-care, all the other things, of course, load onto that to make things better and where you're able to, to, to ask for, to know what you want and ask for what you want in a way that feels wonderful whether you get it or not. And that all the things that Laura Doyle Connect offers, you know, from the podcast, the Facebook group, coaching, there's so many things that you offer um, that are, you know, so worth it. You know, for me personally, this was the best investment I've ever made in myself, in my life, um, in my marriage, in my family. And I had to sacrifice to do it. And if you think you don't have the money to do it, I had to, I found a way borrowing using out of retirement savings and it's worth every penny. I've had more interest come back in real quality, contented life. And I just, I want to encourage any woman out there that no matter what it looks like right now, there is hope for you to have joy. There is hope for you to be able to be an example to your children or your grandchildren, to anybody, you know, sister or anybody, your friends. There's a chance to feel a sense of, of contentment and fulfillment that, you know, I'm a lot older and I never thought this was possible. And like, so I want to say is don't wait, mm-hmm. you know, reach out and, and see what fits for you, but don't give up. Like I had to learn, even under dark circumstances, stay the course. There are so many tidbits of gold that I have to have a vault now of all this relationship gold wisdom that I now have and have learned through Lord Doyle Connect. That I mean, seriously, the vault has I've had to reinstall a bigger vault. Um, every day I learn another piece of gold. And then the communication that you have with women, like minded women. I have to say that that's been of the greatest value. And this is worldwide. I love that it's worldwide. And we get to share this with other women safely. It's such a safe, sacred space. And I used to not talk to women. You know, everybody talked to me, but I was kind of not not like that. I, I, I had friends that were boys and it wasn't, I mean, now just, This has changed me totally. So any woman out there that's feeling lonely or disconnected, whether it's to your partner or anywhere in your life or family, um, there is a community of like-minded women who has been life-changing. I've been able to turn to these women time and time again, and I miss it. Like, luckily, fortunately, I get to do it every week. 
and and then some, you know, with partner coaching and other things, it the friendships that I have created in this are unique and different and safer than anything I've ever experienced because these are women that will stand for marriage. And I'm blessed to have a friend who, well, she knows a lot about it because I talk about it a lot, but she, my friend who's not in the program, who's widowed, she's still standing. And I gave her the book, Empowered Single, by the way. I just, I just want to say that w- wonderful book. I know I'm talking too much and I do that a lot, but I mean, I could go on forever, Laura, because, you know, I've seen it from all the sides and, you know, I'm going on a lot of years of being a professional. And have seen the struggles and the damage done. And for me, for anybody out there, please know there is hope. Please know that you are loved. Please know there's a safe place you can go and be yourself and dig out of whatever hole you may find yourself in. No matter what he may be doing or not doing, that you can feel loved and empowered. And I and I just implore everyone to take the step and then to stay with it. Well, it's certainly inspiring to hear all that you've created, Liz, and the courage that you've shown to uh, really fix your family, not just uh, your marriage, but it sounds like with all your children, your grandchildren. And uh, so thank you for coming on and sharing so vulnerably and openly with us. This has been very valuable. Thank you, Laura. What an honor. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. It's time for the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award. It's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice. Yeah, it's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week. And the advice that's appalling to me this week is from a business leader who sent me some communication advice in my email. I'm summarizing his advice, which suggests asking a colleague, quote, is now a good time to share some feedback with you? Is now a good time to share some feedback with you? And then he suggests that you say what you didn't like about what they did, and then to say how you were frustrated about it, and you couldn't understand why it was happening, and then ask them to explain. Whew. The advice and the examples he gives are in the business arena, but uh, I decided to give it the worst relationship advice of the week award because the longer you practice the intimacy skills, the more they seep into every relationship you have, even with colleagues, which I love because it makes all my relationships more peaceful and calm and connected and productive too. And the structure this business leader shared for giving feedback will flop, no matter who you say it to, in my experience. I've you know, tried it with my husband. I've tried it with my team. I've tried it with my sisters and my friends and my parents. And it just flops all over town. So once I learned how to express my desires in a way that inspires, it made approaches like this one seem pretty lousy. In fact, you couldn't pay me to use this approach now because it would likely cause conflict with the person and lower their morale. And I feel like I'd lose a lot of goodwill. And and I would also hate to lose so much dignity by being so critical and whiny like that. Yikes. Wouldn't want to do that. Because asking someone if you can share some feedback with them is the same as saying, how about if I criticize you right now? Is now a good time for that? Were you about to get defensive anyway? Yes? Well, great. That's what I was hoping, or I wouldn't be asking it this way. You might think, well, giving feedback is is neutral. Everyone needs feedback to grow. 
And that's what I used to think too. But ever since I discovered that there's a very simple and powerful way to get a much better response from my husband and with everyone else I interact with, I wouldn't want to go back to giving feedback. And that's true in my marriage and my friends, my family, my team. Have you ever heard that expression that how you show up one place is how you show up everywhere? Yeah, that's my experience too. So why use thinly veiled criticism when I already made that mistake in my marriage and I found it didn't get me anywhere that I wanted to be? So here's what I mean. What if instead of saying, is now a good time to share some feedback with you? You started with gratitude. I know it seems counterintuitive because what you're really wanting is for the person to improve in some way. And it seems like the way to get them to improve is to explain what they did wrong, right? But what if criticism is the counterfeit that seems like it will get you what you want when what would really be powerful in giving you a better experience is starting with gratitude instead? You know, in this example, I might start with gratitude by saying, hey, thanks for the work you did on this project. That was so valuable. Instead of asking for permission to criticize, I'm starting with an acknowledgement of the contribution that this person made. And you know what? Now that person is probably listening very closely at this point because practically everyone you meet is starving for acknowledgement. So next, instead of my complaint about why I was so frustrated and worried, I would hone in on my desire. In this case, I might say, I would love to have your valuable part of these projects two days in advance of the deadline so that there's time for review. And in a business context, I might say, you know, how would that be for you? And then listen closely so I understand what might be in the way for them. And then I'd be vigilant about finding evidence that the person did what I wanted. And I'd give them more gratitude and acknowledgement because now I'm having the experience I want to be having. I'm already having that experience. And that's the magic of choosing my gratitude over my urge to criticize and complain. With criticism and complaining, I create my own lonely, frustrating prison. With gratitude, I live in an abundant, magical, loving world where it feels like everyone wants to make me happy, even colleagues and vendors and contractors. So for that reason, the advice is now a good time to share some feedback with you and then offering criticism and complaining is the very worst relationship advice I've heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, we'll talk about how to recover from an affair. In the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Fun is so important. Today's fun fact is that I asked my husband, John, to put himself in my students' shoes and listen to something I was working on. And he said, I don't know which is harder, pretending I'm a woman or pretending that I'm struggling with my marriage.